Hello, everyone. So nice to see many of you here. I know you made the right decision to come. So uh, I'm Anna Sobek, and I'm only here to welcome Melissa Gomez, who has volunteered, nicely volunteered, to give this seminar to us. And um, Melissa has a PhD from ACES, and now she works uh, for the IPCC as a graphics and communications officer um, at the technical support unit, working group one, right? Yes. Correct. Yes. Uh, and I very much look forward to this seminar, uh, where we will learn about visual communication and how to present our data in a smart way. So thank you for being here. Thanks, Anna, for uh, the introduction and welcome, everyone. Uh, I hope I speak loud enough for the people on the back. Otherwise, let me know. Um, it's very strange to be here. So last time I, I made a presentation here was three years ago to defend my PhD. So I'm very happy to be back. This time I will, I will not talk about perfluorinated compounds. I will talk about uh, visual um, communication. And I have to make a, a little um, disclaimer that um, I'm uh, here, I'm, I'm working for the IPCC, but I'm not representing the IPCC uh, through my talk. So I will be talking about what we're doing, but I'm not representing them. All right. So you all uh, know that we are not in the 90s anymore. Right now we are living in what we call uh, the digital era. And thanks to the internet and to the technology that we have, the information is readily available for most of us anytime, anywhere. And as a consequence, communication has become more and more visual. So we um, communicate information more through videos, through infographics, or through interactive uh, figures. And um, the science, the, the science um, community uh, should better take those uh, visual codes in their work uh, on a weekly basis because uh, that becomes uh, quite important nowadays. And you as scientists are doing a lot of uh, visual communication or uh, already in your daily work. You're preparing figures for your papers. You're probably preparing uh, slides, PowerPoints to support your presentations. You're also preparing posters for conferences. And also sometimes journals are requesting um, table of content art, which are those little figures that represent the content of your paper, the topic of your paper. You might uh, be submitting grant applications where you have flowcharts or uh, scientific schematics, as well as scientific uh, figures representing complex concepts. And finally, you might start uh, representing your abstract visually. This is something that has started in the medical world in 2016, and it's just presenting your abstract as, a, as an infographic. But what is really, uh, what do we mean by visual communication? So basically, it's um, transforming and organizing your data and complex concepts into uh, understandable information, and in this case, visual, uh, in a visual way. And this information is to be presented to an audience to convey a message. And if this is done right, and if this, uh, so if this is done right, the message will resonate in your audience mind, and this will create new knowledge that will maybe end up in new ideas or even better into actions. But um, you cannot force new knowledge into someone's mind. You really need to play by your audience rule. You need, really need to understand how they will understand the figure. And um, right now, so my talk is divided into two parts. The first part, I would like to um, present a case study on how visual um, communication has been integrated in um, 
scientific work of a big organization um, of the IPCC, in that case, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, who, uh, objective, whose objective is to communicate very complex con scientific concepts to a non-expert audience. So a bit of background. Uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC, is a United Nations body that was created 31 years ago, so in uh, 88, and its primary objective is to provide the world with a clear scientific view on the, on the state of climate change and the environmental, economical, and social impacts, as well as the mitigation options, and ultimately to support decision making. So it consists in a panel. Uh, so the, in the panel, you have all the government delegations that meet at plenaries and they uh, make decisions on the agenda, on what the IPCC should do, what's the report they have to write, what's the content of the report, and so on and so forth. And then you have the scientific uh, side, which is supervised by co-chairs and bureau members, and they supervise the uh, assessment work of four different uh, working groups. So the working group one will assess the physical science behind climate change. Working group, working group two will assess the um, adaptation and vulnerability of uh, humans and ecosystems. And working group three will look at uh, mitigation options. And finally, we have uh, the task force on national greenhouse gas inventories. So in each of these working group, there are hundreds of scientists, hundreds of authors that come together to write those huge IPCC reports. And typically, um, a, a working group meeting looks like this. So it's a lot of people coming from all around the world, um, those authors, those scientists are working for free on top of the daily job they already have. So it's a huge commitment that they're doing here for the community. So the IPCC has a very big challenge at hand. They have to assess the jigsaw that is climate change and communicate it clearly. So IPCC is not doing science. IPCC is assessing science. They actually um, look at the latest uh, research done in the topic of climate change, and they write this big uh, report. And from this big report, they extract the information that is relevant for policymakers, and they compile this in a summary for policymakers, which is only 20 pages. So for you to have a bit of context, this is how the big report looks like. And this is how the summary for policymaker is. So this is the condensed information uh, that policymakers are interested in for um, making decisions. And it's complex because they have to be policy relevant when choosing the information. They have to be policy non-prescriptive when they write the, 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 the summary for policymakers. That means they should not say what you have to eat, what, how you have to commute to work. It's non-prescriptive. The assessment has to be global. It has to cover um, the entire world and not one specific region over another. And last but certainly not least, it has to be clearly uh, communicated. So as I said, the main audience of the IPCC are policy uh, makers. We, of course, have other audiences like uh, the public health sector, the education sectors, the agriculture sector, and so on and so forth. But primarily, we create this uh, assessment for policymakers. And in those uh, summary for policymakers, you have text, but you also have uh, scientific figures or figures to support visually uh, what the assessment says. And the IPCC process is very interesting in a way that the authors get a chance to have direct feedback from their audience. 
So the drafts are circulated among the government delegates, and then they provide their comments. So they might say, look, in this figure, this scholar will not, don't quite understand what it means, or maybe this element is missing. Here, this is not clear what you mean. And then we get those comments, and we can improve our figure, which will end up on the desk of policymakers. So we can really tailor the information to them. But even with this, um, the IPCC has been criticized a lot about how they communicate their uh, information. Um, it has been criticized because the IPCC is making uh, reports that are very hard to understand, not quite digestible. And um, this has been going on for, for a long time now. But now we are in the sixth cycle of assessment. So uh, the IPCC works in cycle. It's a seven-year cycles. And it's a turning point for the IPCC. At the beginning of this cycle, the organization officially acknowledged uh, the need of improving their communication. And for this to bring in uh, expertise in fields of um, media, communication, but also design and information design, as well as uh, cognitive um, uh, science to understand better the information. So right now, we are preparing the, those um, uh, big uh, re assessment reports, but we already have approved uh, three special reports between last year and this year. So this gives uh, uh, material to see how figures have evolved uh, between the previous cycles and now when we have integrated some expertise in, uh, in the work of the assessment. So back then, that's how uh, figures typically looked like in a summary for policymaker. So you have to imagine policymakers are not uh, experts like you might be in your fields. Um, so you can see there's little text, there is the legend, but there is a mixture of um, maps and then line graph, and we don't really know um, what is the message behind this figure, and this is even more complex. The layer of inform the amount of information is uh, quite intense. Information is being communicated through icons. Then we have also maps. We have um, a bar graph. So without a very clear uh, direction for the reader in where to look at and when. And now the information we try to uh, communicate is still as complex and uh, still as, um, as intense, but we really try to bring a certain narrative in the figures. So it might take still some time to under understand what's going on, but we have added some elements that hopefully direct the reader attention and also uh, bring the, the, the explanation when it's needed. For example, here we bring a title before even entering the quantitative uh, elements. We also bring labels that will explain directly what the visual elements are close to where they are. We also uh, don't forget to represent the robustness of the assessment. We don't want to simplify the data. We want to be accurate, but we want it to be clear. So this is, for example, where we put the, um, the, uh, the, 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 the likely range of the different curves. And finally, we try to unclutter the design. That means only make salient what is necessary uh, to convey the message. And all the rest is being brought in the back with this gray color instead of black. So this is another example of summary for policymaker figure from that cycle. And it's very interesting to see how um, the game has changed now. We have brought this discussion of designing figures to the highest level of uh, an approval of an IPCC report. Here you can see my colleague Angela discussing design aspect of figures with different countries' delegation. 
So whenever you're creating uh, a figure, it has to be done for the audience. It's not for you, it's for the audience. And you have to adapt yourself um, for the needs of the audience and, and their, and their um, knowledge and background. And there's a very nice example in the IPCC report of uh, uh, global warming of 1.5. This is a figure from the technical, uh, from, from the main reports, which tend to be more technical and more for scientists. And then we elevated that figure for, summer, for the policymakers. So you can see that we have removed already some elements that seem quite complicated. And then we have also added some um, um, labels to explain better what's going on. And then we have adapted that figure for the lay audience. So it's a bit more infographic style, a bit less heavy in the technical aspect. And finally, we wanted to reach the people uh, more universally and remove all the quantitative aspects of a graphic. And we actually uh, asked an artist to reproduce that figure, uh, which became the front cover of that report. So now I hope you're all warmed up. And we can start to actually talk about the different uh, um, um, design um, aspect that you can add in your own figures to make your figures engaging. So the way we understand and process the information in a figure is the same way we process the information in our surrounding, in our environment. It's all about perception. And perception, by definition, is the organization, the identification, and the interpretation of sensory information in order to represent and understand the presented information or your environment. And so perception is based on intuitive processes, on processes that are unconscious, but it's also based on your personal knowledge, on your experience, on your culture. And the key design principles that I'm going to present now they are all derived from an understanding of this human perception. So back to the data now. Um, you can present data like this in a table. Um, this will be, uh, as you can see, complicated to kind of read um, what they mean. Uh, you can see that there are different people but you don't know how they relate to each other, how they compare to each other. So it's quite abstract. But when you start to put um, physical attributes behind those data, like space, like shape, colors, spatial distribution, the, the, the data start to make sense. You can start to see the story behind those data. And that's the whole point of representing your data visually. But you have to watch out, because if this is not done correctly, you can really mislead your reader and who will end up with another message than the intended one. So there's this team of um, cognitive psychologists uh, based in um, Tyndall Centre in UK, in the England. And by the way, uh, Dr. Jordan Harold is one of the experts we have been working with. Uh, at the IPCC, and they, um, they created um, a guidance to make um, uh, engaging figures. And this guidance, this guidance, this guidance, sorry, is encapsulated in the MATE principle. So what is the MATE principle? M stands for message, and the question behind that is, is my visual representing and communicating the right message that I want? A stands for audience. Is the figure, um, is the visual adapted for my audience? D stands for design. Are my design choices backed up by evidence-based um, design uh, principles? And finally, evaluation for E. Did I test my figure beforehand on someone that represents uh, the target 
audience. So if you follow all these questions, if you ask yourself all these questions, you will end up with a figure that is more en that is certainly more engaging than if you don't. Uh, by the way, the guidance is available on that website here, so I invite you to go and check. It's very well made. Um, so let's go step by step through uh, this mate principle uh, concept. First of all, before even thinking of how your figure will look like, you need to think about the message. What is the message you want to communicate? So I invite you to take a pen and a paper and write in one sentence, maximum two, what is the thing that the reader has to take home when they see your figure. And this is very um, important because all your design choices will have to always back up this message. And something that you don't want is to create a figure that actually contradicts your assessment in your paper or what you're trying to, to say. And this can be done quite easily. Here I have an example. Um, that's a figure from a um, historic book for uh, kids, so for a school, uh, that was done back in the 80s or the 90s. And it represents the, the northern and southern population in the United States between 1820 and 1860 in rural areas and in urban areas. And there's this group of researchers, Shai and Hefner, that wanted to test uh, if this figure was actually conveying the, the message, the right message. So they asked kids what they were seeing in this figure. The kids were analyzing actually each bar within each year. So that's what they were seeing first. And then I myself asked um, adults what they were seeing in this figure. And probably that's also the trend that you're seeing is that the rural area in the south is increasing more than the rural area in the north. This is probably the most striking message that most of us are seeing right now. But then when you look at the main text that comes together with that figure, it says that in the decades preceding the war, the north was urbanizing, but the south remained largely rural. This is not the message that is striking for the first time when you look at that figure. Probably if you would have plotted your data differently, if you would have used a, a, a line plot like this one, showing the percent of population that is rural over time in the south and in the north, together with the increase of population, which is uh, quite stable both in the north and the south, then this mes message would have been more striking. Then you could see that indeed the North is losing people in the rural area for the benefit of the cities. Then it's time to think about the reader or your audience. You need to ask yourself who is going to look at your figure and what is the background of those people? What is the background knowledge? What's their interests? It's a very important question because they give you a hint on their ability to read the graphic or if they would need more guidance than uh, uh, an expert, than your colleague, for example. And there is, so we are all unequal in the way we read the graphic and this is uh, based on our, uh, on different abilities among which um, sorry, among which spatial thinking ability. We all have a very specific one based on our occupation or our science. And this was tested by uh, Resnick et al. They have uh, asked uh, different scientists from different fields which, one of the, which ones of the four uh, objects below correspond to the one on top. And they timed the response of the scientist. And I guess right now you're doing exactly the same exercise yourself. So I'm going to give the response. It's those two. And they found out that um, Q 
chemists and geologists were extremely good at that exercise. And that's simply because on a daily basis, they're working with 3D ge geological structures or simply those um, uh, molecule um, structures. So it's very easy to, for them to, uh, to make this exercise. Now, it might not be easy for them to understand that graphic. This is a oceanographic cross-section of salinity in the Pacific. I guess there is no oceanographers here. So I, I believe that you think the same way as me. This is very hard to see the Pacific Ocean here. We don't really know, OK, it's south, it's north, but then it's shown horizontally, whereas south and north should be like this. It's very hard to, to spatially visualize that information. So when you face something like this, when you know that your audience doesn't have the spatial thinking ability to understand straight away your figure, you have to lower down uh, the need of this spatial thinking ability and, and, and support comprehension by adding some cues or labels and so on. And I tried to find an example like this for um, an organic analytical chemistry. And I think that the mass spec results might need a kind of spatial thinking ability because the process behind all this with the, uh, the splitting of the molecule and, and, and split them up in this machine is somehow uh, a 3D process as well that requires some um, capacities of representation. Then it's time to think of the visual format. So there are many ways you can plot your data. You can choose line plots, bar plots, um, uh, maps. Sometimes it's pretty obvious, but sometimes it's not. And there is a tendency to think like, OK, let's do something really like crazy and, and a, a novel way to represent the data like this. And this is a, um, a figure from the uh, 1.5, so the special report on global warming of 1.5 degree. I'm calling it 1.5 report in case because it's shorter. Um, and this is representing the interaction between mitigation option in climate change and um, the SDGs, so the Sustainable Development Goals, showing uh, synergies and uh, trade-offs. It's very hard to see this. This is probably a figure you want to hang, out, hang up in your living room, but certainly not dig into and trying to get what's the message. It's probably easier to get it from such a format, which is probably more boring visually, but certainly more effective in conveying the message. And that's something that has been tested by um, Dr. Jordan, Jordan Harold with the um, government uh, delegates uh, in the IPCC. And he has shown um, so two sets of data, different uh, type of data. And he has shown them in a format that is quite original, that's A and then in a format that is uh, more familiar, like bar, bar plots. And surprising, so they, he asked them, where do you understand that message better? And they all answered in majority in B. That was much easier to, to get the information from B. So this suggests that it's preferable to always use something that is familiar. Uh, uh, a, 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 a format that is uh, simple and, and, and not too complex because the reader will not need to spend 10 minutes to understand how to get the information from this new format he or she doesn't know. Then there is a certain narrative in your figures. So sometimes you don't, you're not showing one single panel, sometimes you're showing different panels together. And there are two ways to think um, your figure. Um, the first one is which panel do I need to show first so the reader will understand the next one. So that's how you can set the narrative. For example, you want to show first uh, 
global observation that would be panel A. And then you go into more detail, into the regional details, and that would be the next panel. So always think of what's the story uh, you want to tell and, it, in, and it, with, in which sequence. And also something to think about is how to organize the panel according to where the reader might go next. So in Europe, we tend to look at a figure from the top left to the bottom uh, right uh, side, which is not the case everywhere. But then you should keep this in mind and anticipate where the person might go next. I don't know if it has happened to you sometimes that you go from left to right and you see A and C, and you're like, wait, where is B? It's quite, com it, it's quite annoying. So always think about this. And this is something that you can test um, when you show your figure to, to someone. Then the complexity of your figure. Sometimes you want to show a lot of information, and that's OK. But be aware that this can be quite overwhelming for the reader. For example, in that figure, uh, you have icons. You have those uh, uh, dots here indicating ri risk. You have a gradient color indicating data. You have uh, confidence levels here. And you have a new way of, this is, this is a new format for many people, which is not for the IPCC, but for many people, it's a quite challenging format to understand. So this can really overwhelm your reader. And a way to um, facilitate the accessibility of information is just to build up the information simply by separating the, um, the information in different, different panels. Of course, this comes with the problem of space, but if you have the space, that's, that's a great way to do that. Also, avoid using jargon, avoid uh, using acronyms without spelling, spelling them out whenever possible. This is annoyance for, uh, for the reader. And by the way, Jargon, that's, uh, uh, again, oceanographic uh, research. You're a scientist, but you do not understand that jargon. So your field is really a niche. And even though you're, you're talking to other scientists who are experts and know how to deal, how to read graphics, they will be lost with this kind of um, um, language. And then you can also think of uh, cluttering your graph. That's a very efficient way to remove all the noise around your data, noise that is not necessary, like the background or the grids. Or you can also uh, um, make the, the axis less visible. But don't forget to put the title on the, on the axis. This is very important. Then the text. That's how usually a figure the, the, the formats of figure. You have the graphic, then you have the legend, and then you have the caption. And the, when you see for the first time a figure, the way you try to make sense of the information is like this. So that's where your eyes go. So first you kind of channel the figure, then you go to the legend, and back to the legend again, what is this color? I forgot about it, okay. Then what does say is the caption? So it goes back and forth and it is actually quite tiring. By the way, this is not your current eyes movement. This has been registered before. But this is, this is like, uh, um, so the people have like uh, glasses, I think, on their eyes and they track, this is really something from the cognitive uh, science field. Um, anyway, so, you need to facilitate that journey to uh, understanding the, the data. And a way you can do that, it's, it's very easy. Just bring the information from the caption, from the legend, closer to where the information is needed. For example, instead of putting your legend on the, on the left corner where there's an empty space, just bring it close to, to the element. The, the human brain automatically uh, connect things together when they are Especially, especially close. Um, you can also highlight something from your data uh, that is in your assessment. 
So really direct the eyes of your reader so that it matches what you're saying in your text. And another effective thing to do is to match the colors. That's also something the brain automatically do, is matching color together. And you can also um, bring things from the caption and use them as a, a main title or, or a brief explanation so that the person, when it looks at the figure, first reads the title and then knows uh, already what is going on in, in the figure. Oh, then the colors. So colors, that's a big discussion in uh, the data visualization world, and that's my phone. I'm so sorry. Sorry, sorry. OK. Uh, just really sorry for that. OK. So back to colors. Um, yes, that's um, animating a lot of discussion in the data visualization world. And I just let you uh, notice by yourself with this amazing figure, which is not a picture from the streets in Rio during the carnival. It's really data visualization here. And I had to cut it because it's a very long figure. And the thing you might ask yourself right now is like, OK, there's a lot of colors, but what do those colors tell me? Should I actually understand that those lines are different from each other? Or are the blues actually, uh, are, the, are the, um, those dark blue actually together? What does that mean? And that's a normal process of your brain, because um, colors in graphics are used to uh, provide information. And we know that so unconsciously we're trying to get information out of this, even though here, obviously, there's no information out of the color. It's just to brighten your life, probably. So always, color, always use colors in your figures to show information and not to make your figure nice. Otherwise, it's going to confuse people. So you can use colors to group things together, group data together, to categorize elements. You can use data, of course, to represent values. This is very much used in uh, climate science. Um, you can uh, use colors for showing information hierarchy or for highlighting one specific thing in your graphic that should have more attention than other things. But you have to be aware that not everyone sees the color the same way as you do. So if you decide to plot uh, green and red together, colorblind people will see no difference in the data. It will be one set of data. Um, there are um, softwares uh, available um, for free where you can check with color blindness or without. That's quite um, good if you're relying a lot on, on colors. You should also be aware of the cultural interpretations behind colors. And this differs among regions in the world. For example, for us, red is rather warm. Blue is rather cold or represent water. Green is for something that is uh, OK or like sustainable. And this is a, quite a striking example. I don't know if you know this uh, visual. It's the climate stripes, and it represents the temperature anomalies, annual temperature anomalies in different cities or countries. And if I plot them with another color, it just loses totally its uh, meaning, because red and blue automatically in our mind uh, refers to um, warm and cold. So keep this in mind when you're choosing your colors. And finally, something that becomes a bit less important because we're pretty, printing less things is printing in black and white. Depending on the brightness of the color you choose, if the brightness is the same in the, in the two colors, 
you will end up with black, basically. And finally, it's um, time to test your first draft. So now that you have gone through all these steps, you need to check if you made the correct choices so uh, for other people to understand the initial message you wanted to communicate with your data. So it's very easy. You just print your figure and show it to your colleague or show it to someone from your family or uh, to a friend. And you ask them, what do you understand from this figure? What is the, 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 the first thing you take home from that? And you can also ask them uh, things like, where did you miss information? Where you, you, would, expect, you would expect to have an explanation on that? Um, what was not understandable? All this question you can ask during this um, during this test, and if you get a lot of feedback and a lot of comments, that shows that you have not uh, necessarily made the right choices. Then you have to go back to revise your draft and uh, fine tune it according to those uh, comments. But at least going through this, you know that you're not communicating something that is totally different than what you intend to communicate in the first place. And finally, when all this is done, when the, the, the test is conclusive and you have someone telling you, I got it, this is the message, and it corresponds to the sentence you wrote on this piece of paper, then you're good to go. So going through those steps will help you um, lend um, um, meaningful message in, in the mind of uh, other people. Um, and it's very important to use those evidence-based design principles because they have been checked for, uh, together with all these cognitive um, um, science and concepts of how humans understand information. But you have to keep in mind and don't be too hard on yourself that uh, figures, uh, creating a figure is context dependent and you might not be able to apply all those tips. Sometimes it will not be appropriate, sometimes you will not have enough space to layer out the information, for example, so you will have to compromise. It's a matter of compromise. Um, all right, so thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I have this um, we wrote at the IPCC, we wrote, wrote this visual style guide with some of the concepts I just talked about. So those, obviously, you're, you're too much for the amount of books. My suitcase was too small. But you can access it on the internet. And I have made a list here of books and peer-reviewed papers, as well as free data visualization tools, if you want. Some tweeters, among which mine, but I don't really um, I mean, I communicate some stuff on, on data visualization, but probably the one on top are much more interesting. Uh, yes, so if you have any question, you're welcome to ask them. Thank you very much, Melissa. Are there questions? Yes, there is a question. Thanks, Melissa. A wonderful presentation. Um, do you have a, a graphic or an image that you created yourself that, that you just went, you know, this is my masterpiece so far? <laughs> uh, and, and if you do, could you show it? So the problem, I. So I've been working with the um, IPCC authors on figures, but I cannot show that because it's not, um, it's still draft. But I have been uh, quite uh, happy with some of them. So we'll see if they make it. If they make it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, in my, in my, uh, during my PhD, I didn't have all these tips. So I can see now many mistakes that I did. So I will probably not show that. 
but um, yeah, um, keep in touch. I will send that around <laughs> if you want. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, Stefan. Yeah, uh, thanks, Melissa, for the nice presentation. Is the uh, does all the cultures uh, have a similar perception of color? Is, th is this no? No, it's not. no. So I mean, with the kind of warm and cold, maybe, but with other colors, I know it's for, for red, some people. For example, in yeah. China, where is Lee? Here, yeah. I think in China it's quite positive, right? Red, color red. Yeah. Because in, I guess in, in European Occidental culture, it's something that is more like a warning, like maybe more negative. So that's why it will not cover all the, the global like Cult expectations and representations. Yeah. But uh, there is definitely a cultural difference in how we interpret colors. Okay. No more questions, comments? Is, is the most common error that we make that we put too much into the graph, do you think? I think the, the most, um, yeah, maybe less is always more, but um, Sometimes it's not possible not to put a lot of information like in those um, summary for policymaker figures. So I don't think that's the major mistake. I would think the major mistake we do is not to think of the audience first mm -hmm. and trying to just forget what we know in ourselves mm -hmm. and forget what we think people um, need to know and how they need to know it or how they, they have to understand it, we need to really put that aside and think in the shoes of the audience. That's the best way you will be able to put knowledge in their head. You cannot, you cannot force knowledge into someone's brain. That's a very good comment. Okay, first here, then there. Hi, um, most of your examples were for uh, quantitative data, but um, I often find it difficult to, I often find it difficult to, to, to um, tell a message resulting on, uh, from a, uh, uh, co yeah, conceptual one. Yes. Do you have any tips? Um, I think for this, um, for conceptual figures, um, there's no really like straightforward tips like for quantitative data. The first thing I would say is really think about if you're representing a um, complex concept, well, write down the different steps. It's like if you would present it orally to someone. Present the different steps one after each other, which is the first element that is needed to know for the audience to go to the next one and so on and so forth and then trying to represent that based on that plan trying to represent that visually uh, it doesn't have to be like um, those like crazy uh, icons and like for example icons always have to come with a, a label because it's not straightforward what uh, some icon can represent unless the floppy disk of save which is like worldwide known um, but yeah, I would say these type of figure really require a lot of testing uh, to be sure that there is no confusion in what you're trying to, to show in the process. So this is a bit more of a practice thing, I guess, with the conceptual figures and probably discuss with someone else. It helps bringing the ideas together.
Melissa, thanks for a great talk. Yeah. Uh, so I was wondering here on, on this slide, you have some uh, data visualization tools and you showed a lot of, you know, interesting figures. And I was just wondering, there's also some uh, post editing tools. How, for, for the work that you do, how much of the figures do you make directly through the, the visualizations tool and how much is post editing and like how much do you need to master post editing to make really good figures and what is the learning curve for that? So those um, tools are, um, it's, mm, so post editing, yeah, it's the Inkscape one. The other ones are basically you put your data and it's producing the, the graphic itself, so it's not post editing. But in, in my work, it's the authors doing the, the, the graphics, so the analysis using uh, Python or R or IDL, I mean, all those uh, programs, um, programming softwares. And then the post-editing is more like how, where you place your, your, your panel, for example. If it's a line graph, you don't need to, to do much post-processing. It's just how you think of the, 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 the um, how you put your information, what do you put first. Maybe you want to highlight that panel because it's the one that is most important. Then maybe you want to have like a, a gray shade a square around it. Uh, so it, you don't need to have, it's not rocket science unless you're doing those schematics that are very like complex in terms of design and I, I uh, they are quite complex. The learning curve is not that much. You just need to kind of see your figure in a different way. And it's not much different than preparing a presentation. You need to have a narrative in your presentation or the way you're writing a paper. The only way is that you have to transpose this narrative visually. And this might help just, just testing and then the more you do that, the more you will see how people react to your figures and, and stuff that you should avoid to avoid confusion. Thank you very much, Melissa, and thank You're you welcome. all for coming and for contributing to the discussion. Thanks.